uh, thank you. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about a system that uh, we developed in collaboration with some folks at UPenn for uh, designing and running parallel batch processing jobs and in particular they're running in a deterministic fashion. Uh, the whole purpose of this talk is uh, to lament the fact that un unintended determinism kind of sneaks up on you when you least expect it. This is really best summed up by this image here that I see frequently on GitHub issues. The, you, I, I worked so hard on some script for a long time and it seems to work fine on my machine and then somebody tries to load it on their almost identical machine but because of some minute difference uh, it, the whole thing just breaks and this happens times that I can count. Uh, I even threw one in there that's open to uh, dispel the impression that this is an easily solvable problem. So this happens quite a lot. Uh, in particular I want to focus on the domain of batch processing. So here's a pretty simplified make file that was extracted from something I was working on. Uh, we have two productions here, install exec local and create binder. The names here aren't too important but the, the high level bit is that create binder is going to create some directory and then install exec local is going to navigate into that directory and run some command inside of it. And finally it's hooked up at the top with this all production which says run create binder and run install exec local. So if we were to run this sequentially, that is to say, if we were to run those instructions that all production in the order that we specify them, then this works. We first create the directory, we then navigate into it, and then we run a command, and everything works beautifully. Uh, the tricky part comes when we run this in parallel, as I say, if we pass uh, more than just one to this dash J flag. So if we pass two instead of one, then uh, there's a couple things that could happen. Uh, one is it works just the same. We happen to have an ordering that works to our advantage. Um, but another thing that can happen is you get a disadvantaged ordering and everything just grinds to a halt. So the reason this can happen is because this make file that we have here uh, wasn't great. Uh, if you squint at a bit, you'll notice there's actually a race condition in install exec local. Uh, it's assuming that this directory here has been created, but there's nothing that guarantees that this will actually happen if you run this in parallel. Uh, it all depends on what order create vendor and install exec local actually. So the issue is we have this dependence on this directory that we don't specify in the make file. So we like us to have some way of uh, erring deterministically at runtime if we try to execute a bad make file like this. And this is what motivated us to develop this tool that we call Deplow for doing things deterministically. So, so what Deplow is, we have this guarantee and it's very carefully worded, so let me read this verbatim. If a program is invoked under debt flow twice with identical inputs and given sufficient machine resources to complete, then both invocations will produce the same output. So to illustrate that graphically, uh, let's have some debt flow program, which is um, shaded in that kind of greenish color, and we give two identical sets of inputs. So here inputs are defined to be like command line arguments are the same, that we should produce the same output bits. Output bits is uh, interpreted to mean possibly some actual files you write to in the files. Uh, I, I had to say sufficient resource earlier because there's a case where you might have some kind of catastrophic failure. You know, you run memory on your machine or your might decide to start the moment you try to run this program. So in the, the event that happens, we really can't make any kind of guarantee about determinism. So we have to put that aside. Uh, another edge case we have to consider is when exceptions are thrown. So if it's thrown, and uh, assuming this isn't like a catastrophic exception like on the previous slide, then we should be able to guarantee uh, that given the same set of inputs, we should also get an exception on the second invocation. Now we don't guarantee that the actual uh, message that you get from this exception will be the same every time because that's really hard to, to achieve in practice, but we should be able to at least deterministically uh, produce some exception every time. Uh, so stepping back a bit, uh, let's focus more on why uh, things behave non-deterministically in general. You know, we, we love to think of functions as, uh, or sorry, we love to think of programs as pure functions that give us some input, produce output, but uh, in practice this doesn't work as the way you'd expect it to. Uh, usually you have some sneaky inputs that just kind of leak into your system. Uh, sometimes you have uh, the scheduler that decides to be uh, wily and give you random orders of threads that can affect the output of your program. Uh, sometimes environment variables have surprising effects too. 
and also subversive things like uh, non-deterministic CPU instructions or system calls uh, can leave machine-specific information in the output of your program. So in order to make this deterministic, DevFlow's goal is to try to uh, make it so that these don't influence the final output. Uh, more than just that, we don't want to force everyone to write all their scripts in the system. We will also make it so that you can have other arbitrary executables that will you can also run deterministically, even if that code is untrusted. So let's zoom in more on DebtFlow and figure out how we're going to achieve that. So uh, with the DebtFlow program, uh, it's written and, and supports some things you might reasonably expect a scripting language where we want to have parallelism in this system. Uh, our particular implementation uses a form of fork join parallelism at the moment, but I want to emphasize that you're not required to use fork join parallelism. You could just as well swap this out with something else. Uh, and also, you want to be able to have other uh, OS subprocess. Uh, don't live per se, but they're, they're kind of outside of it. But we do want to have some way of interfacing between DebtFlow and these other subprocesses. So to do this, we have a determinizing sandbox where we run the men called libdebt. Um, and in particular, even if the, the code in these subprocesses is untrusted, we provide some kind of barrier that reinterprets this code in a way that's deterministic. Uh, so to give an example of one thing we have to do in order to reinterpret this, uh, these subprocesses might themselves have parallel code. Uh, in order to make sure that this is safe, we sequentialize all this. So before we had squiggly lines representing threads. These were running independently up in DebtFlow, but down below in libdebt, uh, they're all smashed together to a single sequential execution. So let's zoom in more on the, the, the goodies that make DebtFlow what it is. Uh, so as I mentioned before, this is written in Haskell. Uh, and the way a traditional Haskell program looks, you have an entry point using a function called main, and it lives in this IO type. Uh, I.O. is important here because uh, in Haskell, you have to delimit side effectful code using a special type. If you have, uh, if you have pure code, uh, which you might want to have because it's easily verifiable to be deterministic, then you don't have to put an I.O. So that eases our burden of proof a lot more because now we only have to focus on making the side effectful bits that live in I.O. deterministic. Uh, so yes, there's, uh, unfortunately, having a traditional Haskell entry point to DebtFlow is probably not the way to do this because uh, there's lots of ways you can sneak in non-determinist and into I.O. So instead of doing that, we use uh, our own with a special dead I.O. Uh, dead I.O. is this abstract type that you, as a user, are not to lift arbitrary effects. A limited API where we can vet that everything is deterministic. So as a simple example, we can uh, rewrite the standard get line and put string line functions from Haskell and uh, rewrite them in a way that's thread safe. And moreover, we should be able to combine all these operations and ensure that the final result is itself deterministic. So here's a super simple example of a script you can write in, in NetFlow. So you start off, uh, you, you call get line to read standard input, it will bind that result to X. Um, and then in between, it will also make a shell call out to GCC because why not? And then finally we're done, we print X to standard output. Another thing we want to be able to support in DebtFlow is uh, the ability to have parallelism and also the ability to read and write from the file system. But we probably shouldn't allow this in an unrestricted fashion because if you combine these two abilities, it's quite easy to end up with uh, races. as one example of a way that this could happen. Imagine that you have a program with two threads running concurrently. Uh, one of them can write to a, write some contents to a file called foo.txt, and then in the other thread, it can read from foo.txt, and then depending on whether the contents have been written with hello world or not, it'll perform one action or another. So uh, it doesn't take much imagination to, to see that depending on uh, the completion of the actions in one thread or another, you can get different results. So this is unfortunately not yet deterministic. So we need to do some extra work here. Uh, our solution to this is to have a theory of uh, thread level permissions for each path in the system. So uh, here's an example of a path and two threads. Uh, you might have read level permissions or R on two of those paths. 
okay for multiple paths to have read permissions at the same time because we don't have any issues with concurrent reads. Uh, the issue we have to watch out for is concurrent writes, which uh, in, in order to write to a, a path, you have to have a read write or RW permission. So here we have to maintain this invariant that only one thread should ever have an RW permission on a particular path at some point in the execution. So in the paper, we have a much more developed theory of permission. Uh, we show enforces the invariant, but unfortunately, I don't have time to go into the details today. With these permissions, uh, instead of the unrestricted fork function we had earlier, we can have a variant called fork with perms that not only takes an action to fork and execute, but also takes a list of permissions. And these permissions are checked out from the parent thread. And uh, when the child thread executes and attempts to read or write from the file system, it must check first whether it actually holds these permissions or not. And if it does not hold a, an appropriate permission to perform some action on the file system, then it will error deterministically at runtime. So there are lots of other tricks that we, we pulled off to make the API in depth load deterministic. If you're curious, I ask you to refer to the paper for details. But for the rest of the talk, I want to focus more on the sandbox that we use to determinize arbitrary executables that we call libdet. So the, the bridge between depth flow and libdet is this uh, system function. So all it takes is a string of a, of a process to run, and then it will launch it inside of this uh, libdet container. Uh, the, the key role of libdet is that it needs to uh, intercept any potential sources of non-determinism at runtime. And here, we don't have this deterministic by construction guarantee to help us. We, we have to assume the worst. So uh, let's consider some things that an arbitrary binary might do that could possibly leak in non-determinism. So one thing you could do is uh, read some directories on your file system that have uh, to them. So, so one thing you could try to do is read from dev u random, which is literally a stream of random data. Uh, obviously, it'd be problematic if someone were to read from this and then try to print it to standard out because that could leak in all sorts of different results depending on how many times you run that. Uh, another thing we have to watch out for is proc because that is a field of machine specific information. So we want to restrict access to this. Uh, to do this, uh, we use this uh, LD preload trick, which allows us to uh, essentially intercept any calls to uh, functions from glibc, for example, fopen, which will probably get invoked if you're going to be reading from one of these directories. And if fopen gets called and one of its arguments happens to be one of these banned directories, then we can error deterministically at runtime. Another thing that we have to watch out for is uh, uncontrolled concurrency. Uh, in in DebtFlow, we had a solution to this, and we also must come up with a corresponding solution in LibDebt. So, so here, we're, we're, we're more pessimistic, and in order to solve on the LibDebt side, we intercept any calls to pthread create, and instead of having them fork off computation and run it uh, concurrently, we sequentialize everything. So, so this is a pretty big caveat here because uh, it means whenever you run anything in libdebt, it has to be sequential, and as a result, uh, there's potential performance problems here. Uh, luckily, we are running batch processing jobs, and a common paradigm in batch processing is within the script level to first fork off a bunch of threads, and then within each thread to shell out to some executable. So we do support this kind of paradigm, though, because uh, here you're not penalized for running things sequentially. In the future, we would like to extend libdebt to be able to actually uh, run arbitrary binaries in parallel using perhaps some kind of system like dthreads. Another tricky aspect is that there are some, some ways that uh, OS properties can leak in ways you might not expect. So one trick that you can pull is to call mmap a bunch of times and try to read off the addresses that mmap returns. Uh, as it turns out in practice, most of the time uh, these addresses are going to be quite random. Um, this is due to address space, address space layout randomization, which is this security technique. So uh, for our purposes, we have to disable ASLR uh, and roll with that. And finally, uh, as one more example of something libdebt has to perform, uh, we, we mentioned before we have to have path-level permissions in, in debt flow, but there's a question of how this uh, manifests itself in libdebt. So the answer is uh, to, to make sure that this works out the way you'd expect, 
anytime you call system, Debtflow uh, passes on the, the permissions to, to libdebt as well. So whenever you call fopen or, or similar uh, libc functions that have to read or write to the file system, it will also check to see if it has the appropriate permissions. And if it doesn't, it will also error deterministically at runtime. So to wrap things up, uh, we wanted to make sure that all of these tricks that we were performing to ensure determinism weren't incurring too much of a performance head, uh, performance overhead. So we, we did some benchmarking on two big sets of applications. Uh, the one that's pictured here is a set of bioinformatics applications. So these are, are huge programs that do some various analysis of gene sequencing and, and, and things like this. I, the details are important, but what, what is important is that these are glued together with some scripts that uh, invoke these applications at various points. So what we did is we rewrote these scripts in Debtflow and then compared the performance against the original non-deterministic versions. And also we measured how much of a parallel speed up it performed. And to our joy, we found out that the lines were almost identical in all the applications that we tested. In fact, in, in one kind of obscure case, it actually got faster with Debtflow because our version of printf had less overhead. So that was nice. Uh, we also benchmarked this against a, uh, a, a series of, of programs called Splash 2 that have a bunch of uh, make files. So what we do is we implement our own deterministic version of make and compare the performance of uh, what we call debt make against the original GNU make, which is non-deterministic. And we also found out there was less than 1% overhead overall on all of these uh, make file uh, invocations, which is wonderful. So there's, there's more work to be done to make Debtflow suitable for running everything deterministically. Uh, there's, there's lots of caveats I mentioned throughout the talk that we would like to uh, plug the holes in. Uh, we also need to do some more work of ensuring that we can actually catch all sources of non-determinism at runtime within libdebt. Uh, we're using LD preload, which is uh, certainly not a foolproof solution. There are other things that can can leak through and cause non-determinism like certain CPU instructions or system calls. So we, we hope to, in the future, come up with a more elaborate implementation of libdebt which can intercept these things. So to conclude, uh, Debtflow has been tried out on some actual real-world applications and we found that the performance overhead was quite negligible and it is quite nice to use in practice, I found. So if Next time you are frustrated with something that's not running deterministically, uh, this might be the tool for you. Uh, with that, I'll turn the floor over to questions. <laughs>